So, prophecy. Let me say the word again. Prophecy. Somebody strike up the X-Files theme song or Twilight Zone. Anybody even remember the X-Files theme song? Oh, there it is. I think I heard someone whistling it. As we think about things that are x filish uh, prophecy is certainly one of them. And uh, this morning in preparation for Easter, we're going to begin a short three-week mini-series that we're calling The Greatest Prophecy, where we're going to look at Isaiah chapter 53. No other religion, think about this, no other religion offers prophecy as proof of its truthfulness. But Christianity does. Sometimes we, uh, we followers of Christ take this astonishing part of our faith for granted. And we forget what a powerful thing this is to have in our corner. It's like being in, in, line, in, a, in a line in Hollywood at one of those uh, tours where they, they take you out on a tour of all the movie stars' home. And there you are sitting in line uh, for, of this expensive tour, and then suddenly you remember, hey, wait a minute, Tom Cruise is my uncle. He can take us around town. Why would you forget something like that? And why would we forget something this powerful as prophecy? Before we climb up the Mount Everest of prophecy, which is Isaiah 53, let's ask a simple question to start. Why would God put prophecy, and we're talking about predictive prophecy. We're talking about a statement in the Bible that says this thing is going to happen, and it does. Why would God put this in the Bible? And it's everywhere you look. There are three great categories of prophecy in our Bibles. There are prophecies about the nation of Israel and then all the surrounding countries. And there are specific things that were said about Israel and her neighbors. And it fills the Old Testament and they all came to pass. There's a second category of prophecies. There's a whole host of prophecies regarding the coming Messiah and what would happen to him. And then there's a third category of prophecies we find in Scripture that has to do with the end of the age and things to look for before the return of Christ. And, and, and it's very easy to see when you open your eyes that a stage of sorts is being set up even as we speak. So why all this prophetic content? Well, there are, there are two primary reasons. Let's talk about a couple of them. First of all, to convict unbelievers. A lot of movies in the last 10, 15 years or so have made a great use of prophecy. The, uh, the Matrix movies. Neo, remember, was the one foretold. Harry Potter makes use of, of prophecy. In The Lord of the Rings, do you remember? Frodo was meant to have the ring. But no one stops for a minute to, to really think about the implications of what that would mean if there is such a thing as predictive prophecy. Because for prophecy to exist, for prophecy to be real, that would, that would mean, would it not, that there has to be a supernatural power over time, above existence, that is governing it all. Isn't that the implication? That there must be a God who exists for there to be prophecy. In Isaiah 48, verses 4 and 5, uh, God is speaking here. This is not in regards to our text yet. But through the prophet Isaiah, here's God, and he gives the rationale for prophecy. God says through Isaiah, because I know that you are obstinate. He's not talking to Isaiah. He's talking to who? All of us. Say it. Because I know you are obstinate, your neck is an iron sinew, and your forehead brass, I declared to you from of old, before they came to pass, I announced things to you, lest you should say, oh, my idol did them, my carved image and my, my metal image commanded them. Do you catch what Isaiah is saying here? Why does God put prophecy in, in Scripture? Because he knows how stubborn and hard-hearted we are. Isn't that what he's saying? And so God gives prophecy to knock our pride down a notch in the hope of reminding us that he exists and that we need him. Jesus used prophecy to jar the unbelievers of their, jar them loose from their skepticism. John 5, 46. If you believe Moses, you would believe me because he wrote about me. That's an audacious thing for Jesus to have said. So prophecy is given to convict unbelievers. Here's a second reason we find it in the Bible. To console believers. So on Easter Day, you, you may know the story in Luke. Uh, there are two disciples. They're unnamed. They're walking to a village named Emmaus. It's, it's after that terrible weekend. 
and they're moping, they're dragging along, they're like Eeyore. Can you picture Eeyore? And Jesus comes alongside of them, and they start telling him, telling Jesus about all the things they happened to him, that, that happened to him. And then they say, and then this morning some women came and they, they told us that they saw an angel who told them that Jesus was alive, and they found the tomb empty, but him they did not see. Is that how e Eeyore sounds? Something like that? See forever. And at this, Jesus says to them these words. How foolish you are and how slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. And then Luke adds this with a flourish. And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in scriptures concerning himself. And while they're breaking bread with Jesus, a short time later, their eyes are opened and suddenly they realize it's him. Life's hard, and there are a lot of times when we're, when we're tempted. Would you agree? Life is hard? Mm. And that there are times where we were tempted to let loose our own inner, inner Eeyore? Yes. What do you do in those moments when God doesn't feel close? And you're not even sure if he's there. In times like that, you know, one thing that's important to do, it's to call to mind all the undeniable, unexplainable wonders that are found in our faith, like fulfilled prophecy, like an empty tomb. Imagine that. How'd that happen? Let's unpack just a couple more quick things about prophecy, and then let's dive into Isaiah's prophecy. Let's consider this a Messianic Prophecy 101 tutorial. In fact, number one is this. Put this slide up. The Messianic prophecies are distributed throughout the entire Old Testament. There's no one section in the Bible that's, that's called the prophecies of the Christ. There's no one place you can turn to in the Bible that says, here now are all the prophecies about the Messiah. Instead, what we find as you read the Old Testament is they're scattered like diamonds throughout the whole thing. It's like an Easter egg hunt. There are some over here in, in Genesis and here in Exodus. And, and, and there are some hidden in the Psalms. Isaiah's got a, a cluster of them. Jeremiah, little old Micah gets a big shiny prophecy. And Zechariah gets a real whopper. They're everywhere. There's no one place. They're throughout the Old Testament. Here's a second fact about them. Most of the prophecies that we'll find are brief, and they usually point to only one characteristic of the Messiah. So Genesis tells us that the, the seed of the woman would, be, would, would have his heel bitten by the servant, but he would crush his head. And then later on, Genesis tells us the Messiah would come from the tribe of, of Judah. Moses in Deuteronomy is told that the Messiah would be a great prophet. David wrote of his crucifixion and of his sonship. Micah, his birthplace, the very village where he would be born. Zechariah, his entering Jerusalem on a donkey, and also that he would be betrayed for 30 pieces of silver. Malachi, that he would enter the temple. Isaiah 53, in this respect, is an anomaly because the entire scripture is a prophecy. One verse added upon another until it just leaves you breathless. Now, this is no small point here, what we've just said, that each one was given only a small piece of the puzzle, because there are a thousand years between Moses and Malachi. So think about that. Why would God do it this way? Give one piece to Moses in 1400 B.C. Give David a few pieces in 900 B.C. Isaiah, 700 B.C. Malachi, 400 B.C. Why would God spread it out like that? And individually, nobody could see the completed puzzle. They wanted to. Jesus said in Matthew 13, 17, I tell you the truth. Many prophets longed to see what you see, but did not see it. Do you know even angels wanted to know what God is up to? Peter said this, 1 Peter 1.12, even angels long to look in to these things. Why would God do it this way? Because it adds to the wow God factor, that's why. It's further proof that our faith was not invented by, by humans. And if everyone, anyone ever tries to tell you that Christianity has been made up, or that the apostles stole the body, and then they, they got together in the laboratory of the upper room and they created Christianity. Let's tell them Jesus rose from the grave. Oh, that's a good one, Peter. Yeah, let's do that. 
If anyone tries to say that to you, and people have tried over the years, you look them in the eyes and you laugh at them because that's what these prophecies are doing. It's, it's God laughing at any thought that he's not part of this. So, let's open up our Bibles. That's a little introduction to prophecy. Let's now turn to Isaiah 52 in verse 13, which is actually where the prophecy begins. We know when Isaiah lived because he tells us when he lived. His formal ministry began with a dramatic vision from God, which he describes for us in chapter 6 and verse 1, where he says, In the year King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. From these and other clues Isaiah gives us, we, we know that his ministry spanned roughly 50 years, from about 740 B.C. to 690 B.C. So we're talking 2,700 years ago. The Parthenon hasn't even been built yet. Or 700 years before Jesus was born. Isaiah served four kings, and if le the legend is true, he was killed, martyred, by a fifth king. He was comfortable walking the halls of the royal palace. Isaiah was married, his wife was a prophetess, and the children that they bore were considered signs to Israel. But most of all, Isaiah is known for the towering, majestic book that he left us. Incidentally, writing in these days was not easy. Anybody know what the writing material was 700 years before Jesus was born? Clay tablets. Imagine that. You wouldn't want to be a bad student back then, have to write a hundred times, I will not goof off in class. Your life would be half over by the time you had to do that one. And yet, at, uh, Isaiah, look, look through it, page through it. It's a massive book. One of the greatest archaeological finds from this time period was an Assyrian library. Because Assyria, they were the, the top dog in this time. They found more than 30,000 clay tablets. Just most of them just basic administrative records of who paid what for, for, for what property. Not only did Isaiah know how to write, but he was good at it. Don't you dare think that people from the, the, the early Iron Age were intellectual lightweights. Isaiah wrote as beautifully as Shakespeare. And whether or not you've read it, you know some of these verses. I know. Let me prove it to you. They shall beat their swords into plowshares. That's Isaiah. Isaiah is the one who said, For to us a child is born, and a son is given, and, and he shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. See, you know, you know Isaiah. It is Isaiah who wrote, They who wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like they shall walk and not be weary. They shall run and not be it's Isaiah who said, how beautiful on the mountains are those who bring good news. And Isaiah who said, God, you are the potter, I am the clay. But this, what we're looking at now, this is his magnum opus, the greatest prophecy. It actually begins with verse 13 of chapter 52. The entire prophecy can be divided into five sections, of which part one is a prologue. It's probably why they lopped it off from chapter 53. It's a prologue, but it all should be in the same chapter. So, let's read through the prologue. Chapter 52, we'll read verses 13 to 15, then talk about it. And we're going to get as far as verse 3 in chapter 53. Behold, my servant shall act wisely. He shall be high and lifted up and shall be exalted. As many were astonished at you, his appearance was so marred beyond human semblance and his form beyond that of the children of mankind. So shall he sprinkle many nations. Kings shall shut their mouths because of him. For that which has not been told them, they see. That which they have not heard, they understand. So like we said, this is a prologue. Of, uh, of sorts, great epic poems and stories from ancient literature, often used prologues. Shakespeare began some of his plays with prologues, which tells you what the poem or the play is going to be about. Uh, let me see, let me read you one of his prologues, see if you can guess the poem. 
Two households, both alike in dignity, from ancient grudge break to new mutiny. From forth the fatal loins of these two foes, a pair of star-crossed lovers take their life, do with their death bury their parents' strife. Romeo and Juliet. It's how it begins. And look what the prologue's doing. The prologue tells us what we're about to see. Two households in a feud. One young man from one household falls in love with a, a young woman from the other household, and the feud will not cease until both of them are dead. That's how it starts. That's what the prologue does. The prologue here at the end of Isaiah 52 tells us what we're about to read in the prophecy and identifies three of the main themes that Isaiah will explore. And it's one of the most puzzling things imaginable. It's a prophecy about the coming Messiah. Isaiah has been writing about the Messiah throughout his book, so we know it's about him. The Messiah is called here by God a servant, but he's far from lowly. He's a noble figure. He's hailed for his wisdom. Isaiah says he shall be high and lifted up, calling us back to that very first vision when he saw the Lord in the temple, high and lifted up. Could this be the very one Isaiah saw there? in his vision. Did he see Jesus? Kings will be astonished by what this so-called servant does. What is it he will do? Surely it's going to be something magnificent. A momentous victory, perhaps, or a feat of great strength and power that will cause people to marvel at his beauty and his valor. But no, it's not applause from men that he wins. Whatever it is this servant Messiah does, and whatever, or, or whatever it is that happens to him, did you catch this? It will cause people to turn away from him in revulsion. We're not sure what it is yet, but this servant will be subject to some act of violence that is so hideous that it will leave his body shattered, disfigured beyond recognition. He won't even look human when they're done with him. And yet this act of unspeakable brutality is what will lead to his renown and his glory. Will lead to something that will transform the entire world. With the information this prologue gives us, we can give this section a title. The renown of the Messiah achieved through suffering. Each verse of the prologue identifies one of the three things. Let's talk about them briefly. Verse 13 says, the Messiah will come as what? A servant. My servant shall act wisely. This is a hard one for the Jews to get their, their, their minds around, that the Messiah would come as a servant, because what, the, what did the Jews want? They wanted a king. They wanted a ruler. They wanted someone powerful who would smash their enemies, especially those Romans. Sinful humans are just drawn to power and greatness. And they could not get their brains around how a person could be both great and humble at the same time. Both a savior and a servant. Didn't make sense to them. But Jesus came on the scene and what did he say? I have come among you as one who serves, Jesus said. Mark 10, 45, the son of man did not come to be served but to serve and give his life as a ransom for many. And the Jews, at least the ones in, in Jesus' time that, that knew their Bibles and read their Bibles... The Jews, when they heard Jesus say things like this, and when they watched him in action and saw the way he treated the people, especially the poor and the lowly, they should have immediately thought to themselves, Isaiah. That's what Isaiah said. The servant language should not have been foreign to them. Not only did Isaiah describe the future Messiah as a servant, but guess who else Isaiah and this is in another part of the book, but take a wild guess who else he described as God's servant. Israel. Israel was meant to be God's servant. You can jot this verse down in the margin, Isaiah 44, verse 1. But now listen, O Jacob, my servant, Israel, whom I have chosen. Israel was meant to be by God, his servant, to go out to the world and prepare them for the Messiah. That was their mission. But as the Old Testament moved along, Israel forgot that, and they got full of themselves, and they thought it was all about them. And in Isaiah 42, 19, God says to them, Who is blind but my servant? Who is deaf like my messenger? Who is blind like the one committed to me, blind like the servant of the Lord? 
How many times does this happen in the church, in our, in our midst, in our community? Jesus calls us to be his servants to this broken, hurting, desperate world. Jesus gives us a high and holy calling to bring his light into this dark world around us, to make a difference for good. But how many times do we throw his grace to the ground and forget all about it and waste it on ourselves? But this is what the Messiah would be like. He would be a great and powerful man who would come to serve. Next verse of the prologue adds another layer to the description of the Messiah. The Messiah would suffer. And this description Isaiah gives in verse 14 should sh send shivers down your spine. As many were astonished by you, his appearance was so marred beyond human semblance, his form beyond that of the children of mankind. We don't know the specifics of how the prophets received their prophecies. Peter said in his second letter that, that these, the prophets spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. And there were multiple ways God did communicate with them. Some had dreams. Some clearly had to have discerned some type of, of audible voice. I think a case can be made for Isaiah, especially in this prophecy, which is spoken with such vivid detail that God spoke to Isaiah through actual visions, that he is writing what he sees as if he were an eyewitness to the crucifixion of our Lord, because he, he describes it so literally. And this had to have been what had happened. And he describes in verse, what he describes here in verse 14. Well, this is what happens to your body when it is beaten to a pulp by rods. When it's cut open with whips that have chips of bone embedded in the leather straps. This is what happens to your body when they pluck the hairs of your beard out. When they thrust a crown of thorns upon your head. When they drive nails through your wrists and your feet. And they throw a spear into your side. This is what you would look like. What's left of your body would be marred beyond human semblance. You wouldn't even look human anymore. And for anyone familiar with the horrors of, of crucifixion, if you've studied it, even Isaiah's description that this human would be high and lifted up, that now takes new meaning when you think of the crucifixion because Jesus <laughs> said of himself, John 12, 32, verses like this, but I, when I am lifted up, will draw all men to me. Messiah would suffer. And why would he have this happen to him? Verse 15 gives us the third observation to write down. The man that Isaiah is writing about would offer himself as a sacrifice. That's why he would suffer. He is offering himself as a sacrifice. Where's that, you say? It's in the next phrase. So shall he what? What's the word? So shall he sprinkle many nations. Why do you use that word? The ancient Jew steeped in Scripture, the Christian who knows his or her Old Testament, that word should spark something. Verses like Exodus 24, 8 should come to mind. Moses took the blood, sprinkled it on the people and said, this is the blood of the covenant that the Lord has made with you. The sprinkling of the blood of a sacrifice on a person, on an object, consecrated it, made it holy, brought forgiveness, provided atonement. And so with the insertion of this one word, Isaiah has told us why this servant will come and suffer. He will suffer and give his life as a sacrifice for the world. His death would sprinkle many nations, kings, would shut their mouths because of him. So the point of a prologue is to set up the themes for the play or the poem or the prophecy to the come. A, a prologue is to stir, stir our attention, get us to sit forward on our seats. It's to awaken in us a thirst to know more. Do you think Isaiah has accomplished that with this prologue? I think so. Now we come to the start of the formal prophecy where Isaiah will unpack these three things the rest of the way, of a servant who suffers and gives his life as a sacrifice. 
Before we wrap up this morning, let's just do the first part of the prophecy. And so let's look at verses 1 to 3 of chapter 53. We can label the section this way. It's on your note sheet. The rejection of the Messiah leading to his suffering. Let's read verses 1 to 3. Who has believed what he has heard from us, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a young plant, and like a root out of dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him, no beauty that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And as one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised, and we esteemed him not. Who has believed what he heard from us is how he begins the prophecy. It's as as if Isaiah knows that what he's writing is unbelievable. To quote your princess bride, it's inconceivable what he's going to write. See, you guys can memorize stuff. You just proved it. (laughs) There's so much about this story that defies human logic. But then that's always been true about the God that Isaiah and his peoples worshipped. And still true true today about our faith, Christianity. We worship a God who is always doing things that are inconceivable. One of the great themes that runs throughout the entire Bible, you tell me if it's true or not, is that God used loves to take weak things to shame strong things. Yes, would you agree with that? That's God. That's his way. Over and over again, we see God choosing as his instruments things that are poor, small, fragile, powerless, helpless, weak, and then using them to accomplish his work. Why does he do that? Same reason he gives the prophecies, to prove it's him and to shame anyone who thinks they're so wise and powerful and rich that they don't need him. So God chooses an elderly, childless childless couple, sends them into a hostile wilderness, and conceives a nation that never existed before through them. Who's the couple? Abraham and Sarah. Yes? And when that nation is ready to be born, it's the weakest of nations. It's enslaved by the mightiest nation. And yet God brings them to birth out of that womb of that mighty nation. Then he sends them, this weak nation, into a hostile wilderness so he can continue growing them and shaping them. God later tells Israel why he chose them. He says in Deuteronomy 7, 7, I didn't choose you because you were more in number than any other nation. You were the fewest. And God changes the world through them, through the weakest of nations. And that was always God's way. Fast forward to the time of Jesus. Who does he choose to be his closest disciples, the ones who will succeed him? Does he go through all the prestigious elite rabbinic schools and choose the cream of the crop? No. Who does he pick? He chooses 12 men whom the wise and wealthy and powerful of the world will look on as common and uneducated. Paul wrote of the first Christians saying, not many of you were wise according to worldly standards. Not many were powerful. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose what is foolish in this world to shame the wise. And Jesus changes the world through them. Say it with me from Princess Bride. Inconceivable. Turn to your neighbor. And since it's always been this way with God, this has always been the way. From the very beginning of Israel's existence as a nation, should it shock us that when God sets out to save the world by sending his heaven-sent deliverer, his Messiah, his king, should it surprise us that he doesn't look the part at first? What does Isaiah say in verse 2? He grew up before him like what? A young plant, like a Rude, out of dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him. No beauty that we should desire him. This is the closest thing in Scripture that that, that tells us what Jesus looked like before his death and resurrection. Isaiah gives us the only biographical data we have on Jesus and what he looked like. And it's not impressive. Whatever you picture a king to look like, Jesus was not it. Get, get rid of, of, of Jonathan Ramey and Jim Caviezel. Get those pictures out of your mind. Jesus was not that. There's nothing royal or majestic in his appearance. No natural beauty or handsomeness about him either. He never would have graced of the Jewish GQ magazine that was back then. 
But it's not just how Jesus looked that caused people to reject him. His pedigree was lowly. Verse 3 says he was a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. There's nothing about his biography that would compel you to follow him. He was from Nazareth and what was the saying in the day? Can anything good come from Nazareth? His father was a carpenter and Joseph must have died early. How do we know? The Bible doesn't say that, but we can speculate that because he disappears out of Jesus' story after the age of 12. So it's likely that Jesus grew up without his dad, had to help with the family. Probably they grew up very poor, and life for them was one struggle after another. He was very much a man acquainted with sorrows and grief. He didn't look the part. His backstory was miserable. He didn't act the part either of how they felt the Messiah should be. They were looking for, for a king. And yet Jesus did not talk, talk like one. How do you enter his kingdom, Jesus said? You, you enter it humbly, like a child. Do you want to be first in my kingdom, Jesus said? Then you have to make yourself last. You want to be strong? Then show mercy and forgive and love your friends. Love your enemies. Rather than promote the temple, he acted like he owned the place. And then he talked about its destruction. This was as upside down a kingdom as anything that they could have conceived of, and they rejected Jesus for it. He was despised and rejected by men. But it wasn't just them back then that rejected Jesus. Verse 3 has a message for us today. And I'm going to give you a fair warning. You may not like it. He was despised and rejected by men. Those dumb people. A man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And as one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised. Those prideful, stubborn fools. And... We esteemed him not. We? What do you mean, Isaiah? Don't you mean they? What's this we? Dear friends, you'll never, ever come to know God or grow in your faith or discover your life's true identity and purpose until you accept the gospel truth that Isaiah has just shared with us right here, that it is we who are very much a part of this tragedy. That it is we who need this man of sorrows to come and suffer and die for us. Isaiah knew this from the very first vision he had. Some of you know the story from Isaiah 6, how Isaiah saw the Lord in all his splendor and holiness, and he heard angels crying out around God's throne, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And do you recall the first words that came out of Isaiah's mouth when he saw that vision? He said what? Anybody know? Woe is me, for I am a man of unclean lips. And I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. And only after Isaiah acknowledged his own sinfulness, his own rebellion, that he was part of the problem, that he had no business being in the presence of a holy God, that he deserved his judgment, that he needed atonement and forgiveness and grace. Only when Isaiah humbled himself before God and acknowledged this was he ready to be used by God. And God in the story heard Isaiah's confession in that moment and did provide for his forgiveness. And when the Lord asked next, whom shall I serve? Who will go for me? It was then that Isaiah said what? Here I am. Send me. Now I'm ready. Dear ones, do you want God to be able to use you? Do you want God to send you? and to work through you. Then hear what Isaiah is saying in this, the greatest of prophecies. 
Only the one who admits that he needs forgiveness is able to go to the unforgiven and share with them good news. Only the one who admits he or she desperately needs the grace of God will be able to offer that grace to others. Only the one who admits he or she needs a Savior is ready to go to this lost world and tell them that their Savior has come. The Savior who came as a servant to suffer for them and to offer his life as a sacrifice for them. And in his death, we now can all find life.